Welcome to the last video from the first module of this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. Previously in this module, we learned about the roles of law and collective bargaining in securing decent work. We can now turn to the specific challenges faced in relation to securing decent work in today's global supply chains. This term describes the people and activities involved in the production of a good or service and its supply, distribution and after-sales activities when these activities are coordinated across national borders. This type of coordinated activity among firms located in different parts of the world has become the norm in the production and distribution of many different kinds of goods such as clothing and footwear, electronics, agricultural products and automobiles. Companies thus divide their operations across the world from the design of the product and manufacturing of components to assembly and marketing, thus creating international production chains. For example, the major stakeholders in the value chain for a bar of chocolate includes the producers of cocoa bean, the marketers of cocoa bean, the people who process cocoa bean, the people who manufacture chocolate and the retailers who sell chocolate to the final consumer. For a smartphone, a multinational corporation will assess consumer interest for specific products, predict future demand, and based on that assessment, send orders for raw materials and to the manufacturers of different parts of the phone. Around the world, a variety of manufacturers will receive the raw materials and construct them into the parts needed for the final product. Through a series of logistical operations, the parts will arrive at a location where the phones will be assembled. Through another series of logistical operations, the phones will arrive at warehouses from where retailers can source them to meet consumer demand. In the clothing, textiles and footwear industries, the supply chain links the studios that design garments, the sources of raw materials such as cotton farmers, with factories where those materials are woven into fabric or other raw textile material, factories where these materials are then cut and sewn into garments, and the distribution network by which the clothes are delivered to consumers. Let's now very quickly learn through a historical perspective how such global supply chains emerged as the key model of global production. The adoption of assembly line techniques for mass production in Western economies after the Second World War resulted in economies of scale and increased profits. But this state of affairs changed towards the end of the 1960s when profits started declining. This was also the same time that, as we noted in the last video, the influence of trade unions started declining. Following the oil crisis in the 70s and other economic problems, there was a drive to change economic policy to reduce the role of the state in economic affairs and to liberalize international trade through the World Trade Organization. This meant that countries tried to remove barriers such as tariffs and duties on trade in goods between them. During this period, trade unions faced severe attacks from states influenced by businesses and companies demanded concessions to tap into labor surpluses and cheap raw materials outside the developed economies. Between 1990 and 2010, further cuts in tariff, the emergence of bilateral and regional trade agreements among countries, cheaper communications technologies and lower transport costs led to a boom in global trade. Firms in Europe and North America built up networks of inexpensive suppliers, especially in China, and several production processes moved from developed economies to developing or emerging economies. The entry of China and Vietnam into the global economy provided a large increase in the amount of available labor but without democratic representation. Profits could be attributed to the differences in wages between the developed and the developing nations. Multinational corporations that built these supply chains in search for cheap labor and globalized economies of scale are today the most powerful actors in these global supply chains. Known as lead firms, they are often buyers such as retail chains and producers of branded products such as clothing, footwear and food. The focus of businesses now turned to achieving economies of scale and scope. Systems were built not to reduce the cost of producing each unit of a particular good, but to reduce the average cost 
by broadening the production to diverse products. There were also important innovations in communications technology and in transportation systems. By using these innovations to reduce times within the production system, as well as response times from suppliers, companies were also able to improve management costs. Today, a single finished product often results from manufacturing and assembly in multiple countries, with each component arriving just in time to be part of the next step and each step in the process adding value to the end product. All of these contributed not only to the growth of the global supply chain, but also to the increased power of the lead firm with respect to the other actors in the global supply chain, including the suppliers and the workers employed by the supplier, and even the governments of the countries where the suppliers were located. Corporate decisions on where to locate their operations fosters competition among countries over the cost of land, infrastructure subsidies, wage and employment flexibility, and by avoiding trade unions. These are often countries competing with each other to achieve economic development by exporting the same or similar products. These are some of the incentives that governments in developing nations today provide companies to increase investment in their economies. For example, companies may be incentivized to make foreign direct investment in specially established export processing zones where tax holidays, weak labor laws and weak inspection provisions will apply. Suppliers also have fewer options. They have to compete globally to become part of the global supply chain. In such a buyer's market, lead firms have the power to set lower production prices for their products and demand shorter lead times to make and ship these products. With increased pressure from lead firms, the time between the start of production and shipping has been dramatically shortened. Such squeezing by lead firms of the production price and the production cycle mean that employment within global supply chains is too often precarious or informal, involving frequent labor rights and human rights violations. Some of the most frequent violations include exclusion of workers from trade union rights, such as the freedom to freely join and work in trade unions, discrimination against trade unionists, or a lack of protection for workers or unionized, excessive requirements to establish trade unions, the arrests and imprisonments of trade unionists and other forms of violence and harassment, low wages, unsafe buildings and other working conditions, forced overtime, and child labor. The rights to organize, bargain collectively, and strike are curtailed or completely denied in global supply chains. This is a major barrier to decent work. As we have learned previously, trade unions help ensure the sharing of prosperity, Workers in global supply chains, however, are absent from the wage setting process. There is no framework for representation and negotiation, and even where one exists, it is quite inadequate. Women make up a large part of the workforce in global supply chains, but most are unaware of their rights and have little or no voice in the workplace. They also carry a much greater care burden that restricts their ability to organize. Along with other vulnerable groups such as migrant workers, adolescent girls and women are overrepresented among the lowest paid. When people point to the emergence of the global supply chain as a good thing, the argument is often that the relocation of production to emerging or developing economies has led to growth in foreign investment, growth in jobs and infrastructure, and as a result, an improvement in the ability of those economies to compete in the global market. China's growth in the last 30 years, including the growth in wages there, is often cited as the example. We have to see that example, however, along with the fact that in Bangladesh and Pakistan, over 1,600 workers have been killed due to unsafe buildings since 2010. In South American countries such as Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala, workers who organize into unions routinely face physical violence. Wages of garment workers have fallen in real terms but prices paid by lead firms to suppliers have not increased. Workers commonly rely on overtime, yet most Asian garment suppliers choose not to pay overtime premiums. Many apparel workers in Bangladesh and Cambodia experience forced overtime, 
pregnancy-based discrimination and denial of paid maternity leave. In the Gulf nations, low-paid migrant workers in the construction and engineering sectors face hazardous and sometimes deadly working conditions and are often bound to abusive employers through the kafala or the sponsorship system. Passport confiscation is systematic and many workers arrive with significant debts on account of extortionate recruitment fees which can take several years to repay. Globally, most child labourers work in agriculture for local or for global markets. Approximately 15% of the world's gold originates from artisanal mines, which mostly operate illegally and use child labour. A major problem for workers, even in places where there are national labour laws, is the lack of an adequate remedy for when their rights are violated. While the production processes span several countries, most laws and international conventions stop at the borders of each individual country. Local supplying companies are unlikely to face accountability because administrative or judicial processes are too slow, weak or corrupt. At the same time, lead firms are usually immune from any legal accountability since there is no cause of action or jurisdiction over them in either the host country or the home country. In response to scandals and activist pressure, many lead firms have pledged to ensure the payment of a living wage and investment in safe and secure workplaces. They have developed internal private compliance initiatives to assess suppliers' compliance with codes of conduct. Such business-led voluntary initiatives have had little positive impact on guaranteeing workers' rights. In fact, businesses have often kept the results of their internal and third-party inspections secret or published only summary audit reports. In this video, you have learned about why global supply chains have emerged as a driving force in the global economy, looked at some human rights violations and labor rights violations in those supply chains, and explored some of the reasons why those violations occur. We were also introduced to the central problem that we will learn to solve during this course. That is, given the drawbacks of national and international legal systems and of voluntary corporate codes, what tools can we use to improve conditions of work in global supply chains? We will start doing that with the second module where we will learn the major labor rights and standards under Indian and under international law. Thank you for watching.